What are some psychology experiments with interesting results? White rats and black rats were raised separately without seeing each other. When a black rat was placed in the white rat's cage, the other rats ostracized him. When white and black rats are raised together and a new black rat is placed in a cage, the white rats accept him. So basically rats are racist, unless raised to accept differences. I'm late but nobody has said it yet. The self-fulfilling prophecy studies are very important to social psychology and their findings have many real-world applications. Basically they brought together a group of kids and formed a class with a real teacher. They gave the kids a test for overall academic skill at the start of the course, but didn't really use the scores. Instead they told the teachers that a few students, picked at random, were very brilliant and scores very highly. They then observed the class for a long period of time and noticed that the teachers gave the kids they thought were brilliant much more attention. At the end of the study the kids took the test again, and they found that the kids who were randomly named brilliant at the start actually scores higher than the rest of the class. The kids, again, at the start didn't score any different from the rest of the class, but through the self-fulfilling prophecy they became the best in their class. This obviously has tons of application in the world and especially education. The monster experiment. Although it is horrible how they left the children with mental health issues at the end, this experiment gave very good insight to how to parent a child. On this experiment, they took groups of orphan children and separated them into three groups. One was the control, the second were told their his lips and were doing bad, and the third was told that their speech was perfect. As the experiment went on, group 2 began developing lisps after being berated constantly. They became shy and reserved. They were scared to speak because they didn't want to get in trouble because of their poor speaking skills. Group 3, however, had the opposite happen. They talked better, they were more willing to improve. They were encouraged to keep speaking and told that their speech was amazing and perfect. By the end of the experiment, they had one group with no change, one group with now mentally ill children with a speech impediment, and one group with great speaking skills. It truly shows that encouraging children is the way to go and that verbal abuse can be just as, if not more, harmful as physical abuse. Not entirely sure it fits into the category but the Rosenhan experiment. 13 people feign mental illnesses to get into mental hospitals and all were admitted with different diagnoses. They then assumed their normal personalities but to be released they all had to admit that they were mentally ill. There was a second part where a hospital challenged Rosenhan to send multiple fake patients to the hospital and they would rate their patients on a scale of whether they think they were faking. They identified many possible fakers but Rosenhan in fact hadn't sent anyone. The three Christs of Ypsilanti psychologist forces three people who believe that they are Jesus Christ to live together. It does not go well. The psychologist, Milton Rokiach, had heard of a case where two women who believed that they were Mary, mother of Christ, were forced to live together and one of them broke free from their delusion. So he figured, three Christs dot 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 what would happen. They were angry at each other. Often had physical fights. They eventually started getting along by avoiding the topic. He would ask them about the others and each would say that the others were crazy. That they, of course, were the real Jesus. No cures. Some unethical stuff. Interesting though. The Monopoly study by Paul Piff. He basically brought two strangers into the lab together and had them play a game of Monopoly together. He randomly assigned one participant to start the game with twice as much money than the other and that participant also got to roll both dice to get around the board, that is, the other participant started with half the money and could only roll one dice. At the end of the game when he asked the participants who started with more money why he won the game, they would chalk it up to their excellent strategy and gamesmanship rather than the fact that they had started the game with way more resources. It says a lot about how we deal with being born into a privileged state. I'm a huge fan of Milgram's small world experiment.
It is more sociology than psychology, but I still think it is really cool. Milgram sends out 160 letters containing the name and address of a stockbroker in Boston to people in Omaha, Nebraska. They had to send it to someone they thought would get the letter closer, but they couldn't mail it directly to the stockbroker. Interestingly, most people that sent on the letter sent it on to the same group of people on the fifth degree. It only took six people, hence the six degrees of separation, to arrive, on average. It shows how interconnected our world is, even before the internet, which is happy to think about. If you stare into a dimly lit, that is candle lit, mirror for 10 plus minutes you start to see hallucinations. What individuals see tends to vary, but they've used this as a test to simulate schizophrenia before because some see monsters, deformities, general weird shit. I did a variation of it for a mate at uni and completely wimped out of it. After my face started not looking like my face anymore, I had a complete dissociation, I stopped looking and just waited out the time. Edit, I can't find the exact study as I don't have journal access anymore but here's a decent summary of it in layman's terms. Edit 2, this is a weird visual trick that your brain can play on you but the effects can seem super real so maybe don't do this if you are susceptible to hallucinations, are a wimp with this kinda shit like me. Edit 3, thanks for the gold. And yes it is basically a scientific bloody Mary. I loved learning about infant development. My favorite was probably the development of depth perception or perhaps the fear of heights. We're not born with it but, if I recall correctly we develop it within the first year or so. Scientists created a raised square platform, half of the floor. Was wood and the other glass. The actual surface of the floor, one meter or so below, was white with red polka dots. At varying intervals of age the babies would be brought in and placed on the wood end and encouraged to crawl to their moms who were standing at the glass end of their platform. In early infancy baby crawls over there without giving a shit. At some point though they stop at the point where their wood meets the glass, or plexiglass maybe, showing that they recognize the difference in height and the fear of falling. Baby's brains are pretty fucking cool. Reconsolidation, when you retrieve a memory from your long term memory it is susceptible to being manipulated. This can lead to to memories being totally changed from the source. This is why eyewitness accounts cannot be fully seen as true. This knowledge is also being used to help people with PTSD by changing the negative memories they have of their particular trauma. The influence of the color red in sports, judges were shown a video of a taekwondo match and awarded more points to the red competitor, versus the blue competitor. When the colors were digitally reversed, judges awarded more points to the other, now red, competitor. Edit, since there's a lot more interest than I expected, here's some more info, red may be a signal of dominance as red and skin is associated with higher testosterone, or possibly higher fertility in women. Wearing red may induce intrinsic psychological effects which increase dominance in addition to altering the perception of others. Researchers found that putting red leg bands on birds increased dominant behavior, as they took the lion's share of the food. For my psychology degree dissertation, I presented photos of men to be rated on a scale of friendly, 0, to threatening, 10. Men received a higher threat score if I photoshopped their t-shirt to be red. Edit 2, thank you for the gold award. There have been some experiments conducted, but the negativity effect, negativity bias is really sad to me. It basically says that negative things have a greater emotional and psychological toll on our health than positive, neutral things. So you got an A on a test, that's great. But you totally fail a test, and the world crumbles and it's a total disaster. A hundred things can go right and work perfectly throughout the day, but it goes totally undetected in our minds. Then someone cuts us. Off in traffic and we fume and rage. I learned about this theory almost three years ago and think about it all the time. Reminds me to appreciate and notice the many little things in my day that do go right. Mice were put on two sides of a wall with a door in. 
Only the right mouse could open the door. Slowly, they filled the left mouse's room with water and eventually when right mouse saw them in danger, they opened the door. However, mice that had previously been on the left side and were now on the right, mice who had previously been wetted, opened the door considerably faster because they knew how unpleasant it was to be in the other scenario. Basically mice have empathy. It's not that psychopaths lack empathy, but rather, they have the manual settings. A specific region of the brain lights up when people experience empathy. For most people it's an automatic, subconscious, response. But in a study where they showed emotional videos to psychopaths and non while scanning their brains, psychopaths would only light that region of the brain when specifically asked to feel for the character, while the control participants would light up automatically. I just recently heard of blindsightedness during one of my cognitive psychology classes. Basically the area of the brain that processes what our eyes see is located at the back of the head, just where your skull starts to get smaller, towards your neck. Because of this, if you hit your head back the quite often everything will go black for a moment before sight returns again. Sometimes though, following severe trauma to this area of the brain, like after falling off a ladder onto a curb or something, a person is never able to see again. For a long time it was assumed that the eyes were somehow incapable of seeing following the trauma and that was why people were blind, however it's been shown that it is just the processing of the images that is damaged in other words your eyes are still working away, viewing images but your brain is unable to process the images so you can't see them. Some experiments looking into this have found that people with damage to this area can still navigate around things in front of them, without realizing they are doing it. So if you told someone with this damage to walk down a corridor, and you placed obstacles in their way, they wouldn't be able to see the obstacles but they could avoid bumping into them because their eyes are still able to view them and send signals to other areas of the brain to avoid knocking things. This is known as blind sightedness. Blew my little mind tbh edit, here's the wikipedia link about it, it's a little bit science why tbh but it explains a bit better what I was trying to say. Edit number 2, so I'm in the UK and it's currently 430 am. Just woke up to pee and I've been gilded. What the hell guys thank you. The car crash experiment. It demonstrated that the way investigators word a question has an immediate effect on the subject's memory of an event. It was part of a suite of studies by Elizabeth Loftus, with various other co-researchers, that began to call in to question the veracity of eyewitness accounts. One time I participated in a paid research experiment. I was basically tricked into thinking I was drunk. I was placed in a room with two other people and we were instructed to drink vodka with cranberry juice over a period of time while we socialized. After we drank I was placed in a room where I had to read some flashing words on a computer. I felt pretty drunk at this point. When the researcher came back into the room he gave me my car keys and said I was never actually given alcohol. He briefly told me that because I was anticipating drinking for this experiment that my brain had tricked me into feeling the effects of being intoxicated. I immediately snapped out of it and was completely amazed at how I felt, 